his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the whole wor the world and became an heir to the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was, that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For, he, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of a land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish for those who were disobedient, with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah of David, and Samuel of, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though condemned through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So that chapter is a huge list of a bunch of people throughout the Old Testament who uh, were known for their faith. Um, yeah, and I guess Jordan brought out in his message last week that uh, our faith is directly proportional to what we put our faith in. Or in other words, uh, the more powerful the thing or person that we put our faith in, the more faith we can have in them. And for an example of this, I had to think if, uh, say, a Chevrolet Corvette and a Chevrolet uh, Cobalt were in a race against each other, uh, most people would 
pick the Chevy, Chevy Corvette as winning the race since it's the more powerful of the two vehicles. And I just had to think uh, with that, um, the more powerful a person is, the more faith we can put in them. And I know God is the most powerful person that I know. So, so powerful in fact that uh, he's infinitely powerful and that means that we can have an infinite faith in him. And I know sometimes it might not seem that we're able to have an infinite faith, but it's just a comfort to me to know that there is that uh, ability to have an infinite faith in him. And uh, yeah, just today, I guess I'm just thankful that there is a God that I can put my faith in and that he is powerful enough uh, to look out for me and for whatever I'm going through. So uh, I'll have a word of prayer yet, and then we'll turn the time over to Kyle and he can bring us the message. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you that uh, despite the circumstances that we can still come and uh, hear from you, from your word. God, I just pray that you'd bless Kyle today. Uh, give him your words and help him to be able to share what you have laid on his heart for us today. Uh, I just pray that you'd help us to uh, continue to have faith in you, God, and just remember that you are infinitely powerful and deserving of our faith. I just pray that you'd give each one a good day today and keep everyone safe. Let's pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. This isn't weird at all. <laughs> First time. Um, first time being in front of the camera without many people here. Unfortunately, there is one or two people here that has to sit through my whole <laughs> message with, and uh, doesn't have the option of turning off YouTube or wherever you're watching this from. Um, but uh, I'm glad that for everyone that's here this, this morning, virtually, and uh, yeah, I am ready to uh, see you all again, missing you guys lots, and my prayer this morning is that uh, we can uh, worship God together, even though we're not uh, in the same room together. <clears throat> All right, I think I'm pretty much set up here. Sorry about that. So this morning, again, I ask for any, uh, your patience as I learn this whole topic thing. And um, I thought, you know what, I've done topics before, but um, it just gets in your head when you're supposed to be an elder and... and uh, is supposed to deliver a, a good message and so but thankfully it's not me but it's uh, Christ in me uh, working through me speaking so um, hopefully uh, this speaks to you this morning so on May 1st 1960 <clears throat> an American U-2 spy plane took off from Peshawar air station on its last fateful mission <clears throat> after World War II the US military desired better strategic aerial reconnaissance to help determine the Soviets' capabilities and intentions and to prevent from being caught off guard from a, an attack such as Pearl Harbor. Uh, so the Air Force commissioned the Beacon Hill Report from Project Lincoln at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which was researched in 1951 to 1952 and delivered in 1952. Um, and basically, this this committee was led by a Carl F. P. Over, Overage, and was overseen by the Air Force Forces Gordon P. Saval. Um, it included members who would design the specialized optics that they needed in this U-2 uh, reconnaissance plane. Um, they needed this because, uh, for those of you who don't know your history. 
the after World War II, America and the Soviets were in what was called a Cold War. Um, basically, there was a big arms race. Um, nothing, no open battles were done, but uh, they were ba basically um, eyeing each other up, uh, getting ready in case one of them landed the first punch. The best intelligence that the American government had on facilities deep inside the Soviet Union um, were German Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe photographs taken during the war of territory west of the Ural Mountains. So um, basically that would have been 20 years ago. So they really didn't have good intelligence um, on the Soviet bases. Uh, so they needed a plane. They needed a, a way of, of being able to um, take pictures of Soviet installations. This is before the day of satellites, before the days of being able to um, use space uh, to uh, spy on other nations. And so they came up with this um, plane. They called it the U-2, and uh, it was developed by Lockheed, and it, had, uh, it could fly above 70,000 feet. Uh, it was built of aluminum. aluminum. It was limited to subsonic flight, so not supersonic. It could cruise for many hours with a payload weighing as much as 3,000 pounds. And its exact operational specifications are actually still a secret. As, as recently as uh, 2015, the U United States actually still used this plane um, for reconnaissance since satellites you can't divert very easy. They would use this plane to uh, spy on other nations. So... That was very interesting, but what does that have to do with today's topic? Um, well, I guess my mind was drawn to this as the plane was a feat of engineering for its time. Um, there was no other method to get this intelligence in, um, at that time um, from the US. Uh, and so, really, in my mind, this plane is kind of at the top echelon of, of what, what, uh, what is possible. It was at the top of its game. Uh, and in the Bible, I believe we read about a man who soared above the rest of men in wisdom. And I'd like to look at his life, his, his uh, start in life, and then also I want to look at his eventual fall, uh, downfall, and just see how that applies to our lives. So uh, we're going to start by reading in 1 Kings uh, 3. And uh, if you haven't guessed it yet, this is um, when Solomon uh, gets his wisdom. King Solomon. Solomon uh, was David's uh, son, his successor. Solomon is the king who was the wisest man on earth. He's the one that led the Israelites to become a very rich and wealthy nation. And he's also the one that built um, the, the house for God, the temple for God, where the Israelites could worship God. So we're going to start by reading uh, 1 Kings 3, uh, verse, verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 15. So let's read this. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places. However, because, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give to you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in right." righteousness and in upright 
uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude." Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, Behold, I now do according to your word, according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all of your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commands, commandments as your father David walked then I will lengthen your days and Solomon awoke and behold it was a dream then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants and so we'll stop reading there but I encourage you after this um, to go and read of some of the uh, feats of wisdom that Solomon um, committed just after in the following verses it talks about um, when he um, worked out between the two prostitutes whose child um, it the whose child it belonged to so that is uh, quite a story there uh, so there's two things that really stick out to me about this about King Solomon and the first being is his humility uh, when talking to God in his uh, vision or dream, he declares that he is but a little child. Um, the task of being king of Israel looked big for Solomon. Um, instead, of, um, instead of just looking for wealth and personal satisfaction, he was king, he was top of the game. Um, he, saw, he saw the importance of being able to lead the people of Israel well. Um, and he was humbled by that. The second thing that sticks out to me is his thirst for wisdom. Um, when he asks God what he wants, uh, he asks God for wisdom and discernment. Um, and we see that God is very pleased by that um, just because of where Solomon's heart was and asking, instead of asking for riches and wealth and a long life for the, the heads of his enemies, and so we see here that Solomon truly had a heart for the people. I think we can learn much from Solomon here as he sees the great need of Israel uh, to be led, but realizes in humility that he is incapable of fulfilling that. But he also, I think it's very important, that he also knows who is capable to give him the wisdom he needs. And so I think that's something that we can really um, take to our lives is that None of us are, none of us uh, stand up or measure up to the perfect rule. Um, we may, some, some of us may be uh, able to get close, but none of us can get there. Uh, so it's important to know who is capable and who to go to. And so I'd like to read uh, in Proverbs, Proverbs 1, because I love uh, Proverbs. It's probably one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, and it's Proverbs 1, it's the, it's the call or the cry of, of wisdom. And we know who wrote Proverbs, it was Solomon. So why not hear from the wisest man who ever walked this earth? <clears throat> uh, so Proverbs 1, uh, verse 20 uh, to 33. And I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. 
In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the, s of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called you and you refused to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despise all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure, and will be at ease without dread of disaster. And so Solomon, um, he heeded wisdom, and God gave him wisdom, and he had a very good reign. He, like I said, he built the the temple um, to, for the Israelites to worship God, and that was not a, a simple building. Um, he was the wealthiest king of his time, um, and other kings and queens from other nations came to visit him to learn of his of his great wisdom. Um, and so, in my crazy mind, I relate that to the uh, U-2 spy plane, and uh, I see it as a feat of engineering. It worked for the United States. First, uh, they didn't want the they didn't want the risk of flying American pilots over Soviet territory because if an American was shot down, it would be a it would be it could ignite a war. Uh, so they sent British pilots up. Uh, so they did a couple missions, and then eventually they did send American pilots after they had successes. Um, and the the Soviet the Americans believed that the Soviets' radar couldn't pick them up at all, so they didn't even know they were there. Um, but what the Americans didn't know is that the Soviets could pick them up in their radar. They would see them uh, flying overhead, and they would scramble their MiG fighters and try to uh, get up high enough to be able to uh, shoot them down or ram them, um, but they couldn't fly up. They could only fly up to about 60,000 feet, uh, so the U-2 pilot was safe, and their surface-to-air missiles in the Soviets weren't uh, able to climb that high and get enough warning initially, um, but obviously the Soviets could see something flying over, so they were working hard to be able to shoot down whatever was up there. Um, so, we'll actually go back to our spy plane, uh, the U-2, and uh, there was a fateful day on May, uh, May 1st, 1960. This was two weeks before the U.S. and the Soviets, with some other world powers, were supposed to get together and talk peace, <clears throat> and the Americans decided to send up uh, one more flight. They wanted to see what capabilities the basically how many missile sites the Soviets had to, to see whether they matched up, um, basically to give them leverage in their talks. And so uh, the U-2 spy plane went up, and Soviet air defense forces, uh, they were able to uh, shoot the, the plane out of the sky. Um, the plane uh, crashed uh, somewhat intact, which was an uh, amazing um, the Americans thought that if the plane was going to get shot down, it was it was rigged with self detonators, um, basically destroy any evidence. As well as they even gave the pilot um, a syringe to um, basically a suicide syringe to kill himself in the event that he was taken down, um, because any uh, American pilots going over the Soviets would have been tried as a spy. 
Um, and so the pilot amazingly was able to um, parachute out and survive. The Soviets captured him and the plane came down um, and uh, was somewhat still intact. And basically it was, it was um, of big embarrassment for the United States to have their plane shot down. The Soviets then des decided not to uh, have talks with the United States about peace. Um, and it was uh, basically a big faux pas um, uh, by, the, by the Americans. It was embarrassing. And so I guess I, I see that the U-2 and eventually they got a little overconfident with the U-2's capabilities, being able to fly multiple missions into Soviet airspace. And eventually the U-2 was shot down uh, as well as the pilot. And so how does that relate to our message this morning? <coughs> um, I guess after multiple, multiple uh, successful previous missions, the U-2 was shot down, the pilot captured by enemy forces, and I, th I see, I just, I can relate that to how in our Christian lives we can get comfortable with our current routine or with what's working. Um, if we've been successful against the devil in the past, uh, then maybe it doesn't seem like there's a need to change things up or maybe not so much change things up as still pursuing Jesus with the same hunger and thirst that we need to. And so when looking at King Solomon, I thought, you know, this guy is the wisest guy on earth. He has all of this wealth now. Um, God gave him a wealthy uh, life and, and excelled him in all areas because he asked for wisdom. So you would think that he would be immune to this human attribute of, of failure, uh, or at least I did. But uh, alas, this is not so as we will read uh, in Kings, 1 Kings 11. Uh, and we'll just read... Um, a bit of what caused his downfall, and then uh, I'll try to draw my conclusions from there. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, 1 Kings 11, verse 1 to 8. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidian, and Hittite woman, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to, clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives <clears throat> who made offerings and sacrifices to their gods. And so here we read about the fall of Solomon. His heart in his old age was not wholly devoted to the Lord. Uh, and in the next verses, it kind of chronicles God raises adversaries to Solomon's throne. Um, and basically... Once Solomon dies, he tears the kingdom um, into two. And so the Israelites never see such success uh, with the king after that. Um, <clears throat> so I guess initially you could look at that and say, well, Solomon's problem was women. <laughs> and uh, that would be a conclusion. But I'd like to look at before that what, uh, what some things in his life that perhaps drove him to um, be becoming complacent. Um, one thing that really sticks out to me about King Solomon's story is he was a wise man and he was at the top. And people at the top, uh, they usually have a tendency to become isolated. Uh, people are always 
coming to them for questions, especially if he's wise um, and known for that. And so I think it's really important for us to know that if God gives us wisdom, we still need to seek out wise counsel from our friends to, to, to make sure that we're not uh, drifting in a way we shouldn't. I think that's especially important in today's society is we are an isolated society and not just because of the recent thing that I'm not going to say the word in because we've all heard too much of that. Um, but in general, we are a very isolated society. We grow up uh, being told, uh, you know, we possess everything in ourselves to be able to be successful. Um, you can do whatever is right. You don't need to listen to those around you to know what's right. Um, you know, kind of the mentality of you go your way and I'll go my way. Um, the lines of, of what, are, what are right and wrong are blurred. And for me, I know that wise counsel sometimes seems even hard to pick out of all of the noise. And so um, I'm a big believer in fellowship. Um, I'm a big believer in what the Bible talks about. Um, our brothers and sisters speaking into our lives and seeking out wise counsel from them um, and using the Bible as a basically a, a ruler to be able to see um, how what they say measures up to what the Bible says. Um, I think, I think uh, fellowship is one of the most crucial things we as Christians must be a part of to stay healthy. Uh, if you Google verses about fellowship you will see that the Bible has a lot to say about fellowship. Um, and so I think uh, I'm going to read in Galatians uh, 6, 1 to 10, um, just to read a bit about fellowship. If I can find it. Uh, so Galatians 6, uh, 1 to 10 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so, uh, in closing, I'll just say a few comments. Um, I really, truly believe we need each other to stay healthy as Christians. I think... Um, Maybe Solomon did, and he chose not to listen, but if he had wise counsel, perhaps he wouldn't have let those wives and concubines um, divide his heart, um, the interests of his heart. Um, sometimes we get told things from our faithful friends that we don't want to hear, but we need to hear. Um, other times, we may actually have to be the ones to reach out to a brother uh, or sister in love to restore restore them in gentleness. If we are alone, we are vulnerable, and uh, it's easy to forget sometimes, for myself anyway, that we are at war in the spiritual realm. We have an enemy, and um, there's a military term that says um, two is one and one is none, and basically that that relates in that if you have one soldier by himself, that's none, but if you have two, you have one. Um, and so we need each other to be able to uh, catch each other when we fall. Um, 
I'd like to challenge us each at Harbor of Hope to consider how can I reach out to my brother and sister, um, especially during this time, and also to ask ourselves, you know, am I approachable? I've asked myself that, uh, you know, through this week leading up to it. it it's um, all well and good if somebody reaches out to us, but am I approachable to be able to be reached out to? Um, I know my focus can so easily be put on the cares of this world, but it is God's Holy Spirit working through my brothers and sisters that helps me to lean on Jesus. And uh, my prayer is that, that um, thinking about this would help you to lean on Jesus, because ultimately, that's the goal, is that we want uh, to be able to choose fellowship and wise counsel that helps us to lean on Jesus more and more every day. So I think we'll just have a closing prayer, and, uh, and then you can click click close the window on YouTube. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for everyone who chose to uh, be here uh, physically and virtually. And we just pray, dear Lord, that you would go with each one of us um, through the coming weeks. Help us to be able to know how to reach out to each other during this time and just help us to know um, wise counsel. Uh, help us to be able to uh, gain wisdom and insight from from you and just that through uh, through that we would grow closer to you and and closer to knowing your son Jesus so we pray to your Lord that you would just uh, guide and direct us we pray in Jesus name amen